field material, uh, which if there's some time at the end, we'll show. Uh, I want to make go to the audience now and get some reactions. Uh, <coughs> so uh, Angela's got the mic. So gentlemen, uh, there. Let's turn off the computer. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see uh, energy storage fitting into this picture of 100% renewables, um, and some, maybe some of the challenges you, you see around that area. And excuse me, I forgot to say, uh, if we could ask people just if you could give us your name and if you want to identify an institution that you're affiliated with, that would be helpful. Sorry, sure, sir. Tyler Robinson. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm going to put that to begin to answer your, your question, right? Um, if we're going to do storage projects, they better teach others how to do storage, right? So long story short, uh, we've been teaching, researching, and organizing on storage now for 11 years. So I belong to a group of people uh, that we do a conference called the International Renewable Energy Storage Conference. And we hold this conference every year in Deutschland, Germany. Uh, we first started in Bonn, then we graduated to Berlin, and then now we're in Dusseldorf. Um, so here's a plaque for the next conference. It's in Dusseldorf in March of 2017. Uh, you want to learn a lot about storage? Come to the conference, because we do three days of nothing but storage of renewable energy. Um, long story short, again, there's three pathways to do this, right? Um, you know, you can either convert electricity into chemical uh, storage. Uh, the most notorious path is through batteries. And the batteries that I like the best have wheels, uh, either uh, electric cars or electric bicycles, electric motorcycles. Uh, why do I like them? Because the individuals buy them, not the state. Uh, so if you create the incentive system and you organize uh, the market, uh, people will buy batteries and wheels. Uh, and the government will have to do very little to make that happen. Just make it organized in the market. The market right now is disorganized. Um, so there is another pathway which is to convert renewable energy into fuels. You know, so we can do that. The most notorious one you have here in uh, British Columbia is hydrogen. Uh, you have hydrogen uh, companies, and you know them well. I don't need to tell you which ones they are. But you can do methanol, you can do a number of other things. Um, and the, the third pathway, which is the most interesting to me at least, has to do with finding ways that humanity can have storage uh, in a very useful manner uh, for humanity. So agriculture would be the classical one, right? We've been storing sunshine. Uh, as fruits and vegetables for a long time, it works really nice. The fact that you can eat an apple when it's not apple season, it's testament of the ingenuity of humanity, you know, or cabbage, or all those crops that last a long time with minimal refrigeration. Um, but you can do the same with other solutions, heat being one of them, uh, that it's very useful for this neck of the woods, uh, especially if you live very far away uh, in the planet towards the pole. Uh, think, think about the Icelanders in the 66 parallel. Their masters are taking heat and making it useful, uh, storing it in that manner, either as food or as heating for buildings or swimming pools or whatever it may be. So that's sort of the three pathways that makes a lot of sense. If you're not in a, a cold country, what makes sense is to desalinate seawater with renewables or and or purified water because that's like a no-brainer right uh, the planet is drying up in many places and if you can find uh, the way to desalinate huge amounts of water with say direct current systems uh, you don't even need to convert the electricity you do the, the uh, storage right away now you can get more fancy like the people from the island of el hierro in the Canary Islands, that what they do is they created two gigantic swimming pools, uh, one at 700 meters of altitude, one at sea level. They desalinate seawater, they put five wind turbines of 20 megawatts uh, total, um, and uh, when there is wind power, and they have good capacity factors at 45%, all the villagers get electricity from the wind. The minute that the wind stops, they release water from the top swimming pool to the bottom swimming pool. 
and they generate hydroelectricity with none of the consequences that uh, pernicious consequences that hydroelectricity can have. Just a swimming pool, that's what they are. Um, and uh, they desalinate <coughs> seawater, uh, and these, the losses on those two swimming pools are 4% uh, because it's just evaporation. The swimming pools, they're actually lying properly. Um, and I could tell you a lot more about storage, but I'm going to tell you just one last thing if I may. So here is something for you to visualize, because you've got a port here, right? This is a harbor city. You get ships coming with containers all the time, right? So you've seen those shipping containers that fit in a truck, right? Well, I work with a company, and that's part of what I wanted to show you uh, later, perhaps, is we make what's called containerized unit battery systems. So we put batteries of whatever variety you want. It can be lithium, lead acid, we put grid interactive inverters, charge controllers, and we can ship as much storage capacity wherever you want. Um, and we're talking 30 kilowatt uh, worth of uh, storage capability in a container. And this is where it starts getting crazy. A big ship, a big container ship can move 15,000 of those containers at once. So we figured how to actually do batteries well. We know how to move them. We're moving these containers for Mickey Mouse reasons all the time. Right? Dollar store items get moved in this money from China, from Korea, wherever they hit it, maybe in Mexico. Um, so just visualize a 15,000 container ship full of battery systems. You all design can power an entire country with renewables like that. And last thing I said about uh, storage, if I may, uh, it's not as needed as people think. You know, that's the funniest part of this whole, whole thing. So long as you have a distributed generation approach to renewable energy development, meaning that you don't put all the devices on the same windy areas or sunny areas, uh, stochastically speaking, you can deal with the variability of renewable energy resources really nicely. So the need for storage is actually much less than people uh, think. Um, does it increase the cost of renewables? It does, but it also makes them completely dispatchable, which is very attractive from a societal perspective. I think I'm going to leave it at that, otherwise nobody's going to ask me that. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Um, Alex. Thanks, Jose. Um, just say your name as well. Alex Boston. Um, uh, at the very top of the sustainable energy hierarchy is, is conservation and efficiency. And it's such a critical imperative for us to enable this agenda. And here in our communities, it's really where it starts. And you're right, communities are their foundation because the biggest determinant of how much energy we use is how we design our cities. It determines how much energy we use in transportation and how much energy we use in buildings. And it's more important in the oil and gas sector in this country than defi in defining the size of our carbon footprint. And after the oil and gas sector, it's the second most important thing in determining the rate of growth of GHGs in Canada. It's just uh, unbelievable. And we're paving our agricultural land, lost 2% in the last 10 years. After the oil and gas sector, it's why it's the second biggest driver of permanent law forest loss in Canada is suburbanization. And it's so, so critical. So uh, what, what I want you to comment on, Jose, is, is how we can actually strengthen um, the role of communities in really advancing, first and foremost, for, foremost, that conservation agenda. Because the socioeconomic and environmental implications of meeting that power demand or heating demand um, under our current um, trajectory is just huge. Like, Site C, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know, you have people in BC Hydro and the provincial government going, all right, it's site D, it's site E, it's site F, it's site G, because that's the way that we can phase out coal in Saskatchewan and Alberta, is just by flooding, um, you know, every major, and it's being discussed, you know, as we speak, um, it's, it's already being discussed. Yeah, well, what do you expect, right? I mean, if you study, uh, electricity when you were on your 20s and now you're in your 50s and you didn't take a refresher in between, <laughs> you're going to be thinking, uh, yeah, that's the only thing we can do, more nuclear power plants, more, 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 be 
big things. And uh, sorry about the accent, but that's <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, you guys got Site C, we got Pickering Nuclear Power Plant, Darlington Nuclear Power Plant, um, and uh, Bruce Nuclear Power Plant. You think Site C is bad? Now try living close to a radioactive dump that they want to make it uh, to stay there forever and ever. So yeah, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, Alex, you're absolutely right. Conservation and efficiency uh, and renewables. I always say that part of the sustainability coin. So the coin has two faces. In the one side, it's conservation and efficiency. And in the other one, there is uh, renewables. And I always say this, and I'm sorry, but you seem to be the youngest people. Um, you know, I, we have to tell this story again and again and again, because you don't know it. You know, me assuming that you know the story, it's a mistake. I bet you if I ask how many of you here have read Limits to Growth, very few people would have. Uh, and it's that old. I mean, it's like Limits to Growth, it's an old timer type of thing. The club of rock people that are all in their 80s, and they created Factor 10 a long time ago. Uh, in fact, the latest thing they sent to me is we call it now Factor X. Uh, not to attract your generation, but <laughs> because X is 10 in numer uh, Roman numerals. Uh, and by, it's also 10, but it's also X. So different countries in the European Union will be able to do factor two, factor three, factor five, factor 10. Um, so anyways, uh, to cut to your question, um, how I understood it is, we need to take the time to explain these things to folks, number one. Number two, and you're very good at that, by the way. Uh, if you don't know Alex Boston, he is good. I quote him all the time when I'm speaking about these things. Um, and, but we need to make it tangible for people. So I was very tempted, but Angela said 15 minutes, um, to talk to you about resurrecting the defunct eco-energy program. Uh, back in the day, uh, before the dark ages, we had this uh, program called the eco-energy. And people would come to do an audit into your house. Well, we need to resurrect it for the 21st century. People should come to your house, uh, and my friend Manuel Paquilano from Chile does this. They hire young people like you, uh, they train them on how to do energy efficiency and renewables education. They go into people's house and do, uh, they go with the person through the bills. How much are you paying for electricity, food, uh, transportation, heating, cooling, etc. And then they do an energy audit of the house to show the persons in the house where the low hanging fruit is and where the marginal cost, cost of investment are. And then they give them a menu, and if the government gets this right, then there will be incentives for you to change your windows, for you to get an electric vehicle. It doesn't need to be a car, by the way. It could be an electric bicycle, because some of us old timers don't like the regular bikes, but an electric bike would do us just fine. Um, and then uh, you can actually start doing what uh, Alex was talking about. What we're getting instead is some macro level programs that do very little for uh, people's awareness. I'll give you an example. Uh, we made a mistake, uh, I'm going to go into the tapes and this, in Ontario by not copying your carbon tax. Instead, carbon trade. So here we're waiting for the new programs of the cap and trade, which will allow you to put new windows in your house. It's a, I've been waiting for a long time. Uh, and it'll be the election before that comes. And I'm very concerned about the durability of such things. So the answer to you, Alex, is bottom-up approaches. And we need to start valuing education. You know, foundations, philanthropy, etc. say, no, we're not going to fund education. It's, it's too <laughs> soft. It's too difficult to quantify. Well, that's really nonsense. I mean, if, if my bill is 1,000 kilowatt hours, and through measures, I'm going to cut it to 200 kilowatt hours. Um, and those 800 kilowatt hours, I can actually monetize them and have a payback of three years. Why the heck would I change? the light bulbs into LEDs, um, buy a uh, pass, uh, what do you call it here, TransLink pass, instead of driving a, a Honda Civic or whatever the people drive. But look at how long it took me to explain you this. And uh, the governments need to realize this. And I think your government's doing better than ours, I hope. 
doesn't make any sense to you. I want to leave it at that. Sir? Gerald? Uh, Do you just wait for the microphone to come so we get your question on the, uh, on the recording? It's Gerald Cho. I'm uh, just curious about what your thoughts are on uh, Ray Kurzweil's uh, forecast that will be over 100% uh, solar energy uh, in 12 years. Uh, that would mitigate a lot of uh, sort of conservation and hydrocarbon issues uh, just by the momentum of the economics with the Elon Musk producing roofing panels. Next thing you know, you have uh, thin panels. You have to have drones to install it because uh, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, refurbishing everything. So what would you think about those kind of futuristic uh, ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to put this up here so people remember it that because it's directly related to what you're asking. So let me answer your question in this way, sir. All renewable energy sources are solar, all of them. Okay? Geothermal sometimes gets bunched up with renewables, but it's not renewable. It's actually based on the decay of radioactive elements deep in the uh, earth. So it's not really enough. But wind power, biomass, solar photovoltaics, solar thermal, uh, etc., mm -hmm. uh, they're based on, on uh, solar energy. So I wanted to start by that. Um, so biomass can be a renewable resource, but is it sustainable? Well, that depends how you do it. Uh, with hydroelectricity is a renewable energy resource, but is it sustainable? Right? Um, Alex was talking about sites, CDEFG. I'm not going to even go up there, but I gave you an example how it can be done. And uh, El Hierro, how we do it in the Canary Islands. But to answer your question, it's happening already, my friend. I'm from Chile. That's where this accent's from. And since two years ago, we do not buy non renewables, period. No incentives, no feeding tariffs, no nothing. It's just, you just let the market decide, and the market decides renewables. Because any renewable source in Chile, it's cheaper than nuclear or fossil fuel. This is without pricing carbon, without the liabilities of nuclear. Just talking straight out of the uh, developer's price pool. And this is happening everywhere right now. Um, of course, you were talking about solar photovoltaics mostly. Solar photo photovoltaics, where is cheapest? Well, in China, of course, because China is right now the world leader of renewable energy. But it's also really cheap in Germany. Germany, which has a solar insulation worse than yours here in Vancouver. The bulk of it, it's really bad solar insulation. But it's really inexpensive because they have over 35 gigawatts of photovoltaics gigawatts, not megawatts, gigawatts of installed photovoltaics. And how is it in Germany to buy a solar system? Well, you phone somebody and they say, well, uh, yes, uh, I'd like to install solar in my house, yeah? Okay, well, when do you want it for? Well, 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 wait a minute. Uh, tell me how much is it going to cost. Well, uh, can you give me your address? Yeah, I see, yeah, yeah, you're, I can see in Google Earth that your house has potential. So today is Tuesday. We could install it by Monday next week. Is that good for you? Uh, well, wait a second. We need to talk about money. Well, do you need finance? Uh, we got really good finance. Uh, no, we got our own money. Ah, OK. Well, uh, what color do you want? You want monocrystalline, polycrystalline, or you want thin film? Uh, well, actually, we're talking with the wife. We want polycrystalline. It looks nice in the roof, uh, in the roof because it does our way. OK, uh, how does Wednesday next week look like? I don't know, it'll be OK. And off it goes. They don't even ask the price. Why? Because they don't need feeding tariffs anymore there. What they're doing is that you are about to retire, and you have your little money there, and you put solar because you don't want to pay bills anymore in the future. And it's cheaper in Germany right now to put solar in your roof than to pay the electricity bill for figures. Um, and this is what's happening. Ask Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, how much he's paying for deals of photovoltaics in sunny places. 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's going down. And just for uh, completeness sake, why is it going down? Because the Chinese saw the bottleneck of renewable energy in terms of photovoltaics. Uh, we had problems with the raw material at the beginning because it was used for the uh, microelectronics uh, industry and silicon people had to uh, compete with each other. Um, and the Chinese solved that problem. There's now a supply, a uh, big supply of uh, material, raw material, exclusively for solar and photovoltaics. And then uh, the other thing that is very, very important is that uh, you manufacture it in factories. And because you manufacture it in factories, and I'm speaking specifically about photovoltaics, wind power is not the same story, it's a different story. But photovoltaics, you make them in factories, the more you make, the cheaper it becomes. And the ratio is that uh, every time the installed capacity of the planet doubles, which is happening really fast these days, the prices drop by 20%. Uh, and that's where it's at. I mean, I'm so old that I remember in 1977, you paid $77 for a watt of photovoltaic. Today, in 2016, I can get it Canadian made for 50 cents a watt. That's pretty damn good. It looks like that. Now, 50 cents a watt, it's what the cell will cost. You still got to get the labor going and the structure, etc. And that's where the costs go a little high. Because if a jurisdiction does not have experience with photovoltaics, uh, banks will demand a high return on investment on the capital that they lend you, called interest. Uh, and the local people won't be very good at doing this. And the few that know how to do it uh, will be charging more than they should. But when it grows, prices go down. I can tell you the story for wind if you care, but I wanted to open it. Does that make sense to you, sir? Um, Jose, I think uh, Michael quickly played the back. Okay, great. We'll take that question and then we'll have the back and we'll come back to it. Uh, this is a question, pardon me, let me find it again. Um, this is a question uh, from at JM Torio. Uh, and uh, he, he asks, um, efficiency and storage seem key to 100% RE, and electric vehicles store electricity when they're not on the road. Are they the holy grail, in your opinion, for achieving 100% renewables? And actually, we'll just maybe take that question as well, if you don't mind answering. I would rather go one by one. It was about okay. a little jet lag. That's fine. Um, so, no, it's not the holy grail at all. I mentioned already that storage, uh, it's necessary, but not as much as people think. Um, and electric vehicles uh, are part of the solution. Uh, the holy grail, ladies and gentlemen, is called sharing. The sharing economy is where it's at. Uh, because, and this is why I keep asking you, please ask me this question, but here I, I have to finally do it. <laughs> um, I just came back from a workshop uh, on decarbonization. The Germans are actually mapping the entire periodic table to see where the limits to industrial development are, uh, in particular for electric vehicles, wind, solar, etc. And the bottom line is this, is that if we're going to repl replace every combustion engine in the world with lithium uh, batteries for electric vehicles, it's not going to work. There is a lot of lithium, but the easy to get at, uh, it's in Chile, in Bolivia, and in other places. It's cheap and it's easy to get to. But the share economy is where it's at. That, I would say, it's one of the holy grails. Because if we can have bike sharing, e-bike sharing, e-motorcycle sharing, e-electric car sharing, oh, that's a double one. Uh, you, you see where I'm coming from? <coughs> that is where it's at. So picture this one. Uh, I just came from Barcelona. Barcelona, uh, all I need is a cell phone, of course a credit card, a driver's license, and then I can, on the spot, book an electric motorcycle, a real McCoy electric motorcycle. It's not these little things that go like 30 kilometers an hour. <laughs> not that thing. I'm talking 120, like a Vespa. Awesome. I book it. It's right there, whoop, I go to where I'm going, and I drop it right there, see you. That's as a, as a tourist. And as a local, 
If I want to uh, have my own, I pay 140 euros per month for an electric uh, motorcycle. I went to talk to them because I want to be the guy that makes the solar charging stations. And that's what I want to tell you about. I have a few <laughs> other visions because I do real stuff. Uh, and it's really cool what they do. Um, but that's, that's the answer. It's to do with, we need to start thinking totally different about this. Holy Grail, community, community, community. Engage the community. The community has to own these things. Second one, we need to do learning by doing, experiential learning. Third one, the shared economy. We need to start thinking about this. A city like this one does not need a million electric cars. It could get by with way less if we share them. And, and I look at you to the young people, because those are the models you guys should be developing. Because uh, your generation does not want uh, to destroy the planet. Uh, and you go to Copenhagen, and they have electric bike sharing already. And the people there say, why would I want a license and a combustion engine, or even an electric car, when I have the possibility of walking, uh, biking, taking the public transport, or borrowing an electric bike if I have to go far <coughs> and being lazy that day. That's the future, I think. Uh, much more promising than the past. My name is Charlotte from Smart For Me, and I just have a question with regards to um, here in uh, the Lower Mainland, we have over 200 buildings that are being planned. Um, this is a mix of low-rise residential and high-rise residential. Um, and this is being planned over the next 10 years. And what I'm curious about is if there's any technologies that could be applied uh, in terms of PV uh, for these large-scale communities, there's, of which there's 10 that are going to be built in the Lower Mainland. Is there something we could actually recommend or talk about to these developers? Totally. I mean, I would introduce it to Alex Postum that knows a lot about how to get the stuff done right in this neck of the woods. But I cannot help myself any further. So an image speaks a thousand words. Um, I'll show you what the buildings that we are working on look like. Uh, that's a uh, hockey arena, by the way, uh, right here in Canada. That's a school. This is what I wanted to show you. These, these are my pride and joy. A friend of mine has a development company and makes these uh, photovoltaic uh, geothermal or uh, buildings with deep insulation. So these are net zero buildings in Ontario. Uh, we're talking not precisely sunny California. It gets cold <laughs> in January, February, March. And the next slide is the one I love about. Uh, well, it shows you, he, he did that part of the photovoltaic, because if you make it flat, nobody sees it, right? So he understands that uh, these things are iconographic as well as their uh, climate solutions. And that's the slide that I wanted to show you, that I love. This guy prints money. What he does is he takes a, we still have a lot of uh, empty lots in, in our neck of the woods. And he just fences it up, uh, puts his pretty pictures up of solar buildings, and sells them. The last one sold 240 units in 10 hours. And he has 900 other families waiting to get in this. And the reason why they sell so quickly is because he promises Canada's lowest kind of fees. Why? Because these buildings don't use at all natural gas. Zero. They use, uh, they're super insulated. You can see there, uh, I think this may have a like, you can see they're building at the photovoltaic system, super ultra insulated uh, uh, pipes in the ground. You got this right here, by the way, where the Suzuki Foundation is. Uh, what's that, Vine and Fourth? This has been done for a long time. But the twist on this is the solar systems, right? Oh, sorry. And that's the solar charging station for electric vehicles. That's a different story. But the point to the story is context should dictate the choice, okay? Uh, so maybe here where the sun doesn't shine as much as in southern Ontario, you'll be better off with a different set of technologies. But the principles are super insulated buildings uh, that allow you to have very little uh, necessity for external energy sources. Um, and pass the savings to the users of the building. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, 
but uh, context dicks, dictates the choices of design. It always should be like that. So maybe in a place like here, I know you guys do a lot of district energy networks, it makes more sense. So I'm uh, loath to tell you specifically for allocation, but just wanted to show you this. These buildings are not a figment of my imagination. <laughs> they're being built right now with Canadian know-how, Canadian technology, and they're selling like hotcakes. And what I do is I talk to the occupants store. How do you like uh, the apples? And they like it. They like it very much. And don't need to go all the way to Ontario. Just go to Alberta. Go to Okotox. How many of you know about Drake Landing? Lift up your hand. Again, the same visual suspects. <laughs> Nick, you gotta tell people about Okotox. I mean, you got Drake Landing. It's been there for, I'm, I'm not gonna say eons, but it's right before the dark ages. It, they put the garages in the back. Um, you know, so it looks new urbanism like. Um, and there's solar water heaters on top of the garages, gigantic garages. <coughs> the sun hits the solar systems of the garages and they put the heat on a, a gigantic storage device in the middle of Drake Landing, which in plain English they call it a park, because that's where kids go play. Um, and they just store the heat from the sunny months in there, and then they heat their homes with that in. Alberta, and this is old, it's prior to the dark ages. So, is it doable? Yes. Is it easy? No. Why? Because we don't share knowledge. That's remember was one of my key points earlier. If we're going to use money, stimulus investment money at the federal level, we should put it through a climate change filter. Will this investment lead to the destruction of the planet? If the answer is yes, we don't put money. And if we're going to favor this type of uh, buildings or any other type that we deem to be desirable for a specific location, you need to tell other Canadians how this gets done, how you did it, what's the technology like. This is called openware. You guys use it all the time. Uh, my students don't, don't like proprietary stuff. It's all open. Uh, and we need to think like that now. Does that make sense for you? I'm happy to talk further about that. We'll go to one more question from uh, Paul Meyer, and then um, after you're done, I think Jose, maybe if you could just take a minute to show some of the solar charging stations, because we've got a little time for those. Yeah, I would love to show you that. Thanks, uh, Paul Meyer from the Center of Dialogue. Um, you mentioned earlier on the RD and D, and you said uh, Canada was very bad, that the diffusion uh, aspect in Germany was very good. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. What what has Germany done that we haven't? And what, is there a way that we can remedy this? Oh, first of all, money, right? Like serious money. Not Mickey Mouse little tri-council grants of a few peanuts here and there for a few researchers. We're talking serious money. You're a researcher on storage, as you like that conversation. I'm telling you, we've been doing 11 years of conferences. First, the first conference was about this many people. This one now, the one coming up, thousands of people. Why? Because if you are a PhD of 28 years old or 30 years old in Germany, and you want to do research on storage solutions, money is there for you. It's easy to get. What they ask you is to be smart about it, not waste it on junk kids and whatever people waste money, and to then share that knowledge and commercialize it as much as possible. So serious money, one. Um, I don't know your university, but mine. Yeah, what the hell am I gonna write? They, they can't find me because I'm thin here, but. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you a real case example. It's a, a solar a company wants to move into the university. They have no headquarters. They're renting space somewhere else. And they say, we could build a brand new solar building here. We can even let you use it for classroom and lab space. So all we need from you is to make it easy for us, and we will do it so you can have a solar bill. Well, do we have a solar bill? No. Ask me how many solar systems we have. I'll show you the one we have. So that's the difference. In Germany, you want to create a company. These guys graduate from university, or this lady graduates from university. They get together. They want to commercialize some of this stuff. They can approach the university, and they get office space really easily. Uh, grants exist. Uh, and it's less this attitude of a, a, a 
form with a hundred questions. Uh, it's more, okay, here's the money, administer it right. We're going to teach you how to administer money properly. Um, so they really got the right thing. That's what I'm talking about. And it's not just the Germans, eh, by the way. Even the French are getting good at this. Uh, no offense to anybody. But, um, it's, I mean, it's transpiring, right? Because they have the European Commission that practices what they preach all the time. And they put out research uh, on how to do things properly. In this country, um, I'll give you an example, just a very uh, important example. So we are going to have carbon pricing, according to uh, Prime Minister. Great idea. All the uh, provinces and territories. I'm all for it. So where's the greenhouse gas calculator sponsored by the federal government? There is, there's no greenhouse gas calculator. So how the heck can I know how to reduce my emissions um, good luck to me. I get, I get in the internet and find some provider. Basic, this is like basic, like basic stuff, right? Like you have to, if you cannot measure it, you cannot reduce it. And you don't even know if it's increasing. So I could go on, but I'd rather show you what, what we do. I think what we'll do, Jose, because we're at the hour, is we'll, no, no, we'll, we'll still show the film, but I'm going to actually formally wrap up the session now so that we'll end the webcast and then you can show it. Just play that afterwards. That's okay. Sure. I'm lost because folks only sign up until 1.30, right? And I think it's time to go. I mean, I'm happy. If you stay, I'll stay. No, yeah, no we, we'll, we'll do this as a post game show. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I want to see it. Keeping my words very important. Yeah. So, um, what I'd like to do is just uh, is conclude our formal part of the talk. We, we will be seeing afterwards, for those of you who can stay, some of the other images and some of the other innovations that you, you brought along. Um, I'd like to just uh, announce that we'll be doing our next carbon talk. will actually be two weeks from tomorrow. We'll be sending out an email later today. And that'll be uh, on the question, is the Paris Agreement on track? It'll be a debrief on the COP22 that concluded last week in Marrakesh. And our speakers for that will be Support Bourbon, who's well known in the city as an environmental activist who was at Marrakesh, and Jennifer Allen, who uh, ranks with the Earth Negotiations with Bolton, and uh, will give you an inside account of what's going on with the official process. So do come to that to, uh, two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to thank again our sponsors uh, for these events, the North Growth Foundation, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions and the SP Center for Dialogue. And finally, if you just give uh, a round of appreciation to our speakers. Okay, so that concludes the official uh, right. part of our talk. Do you want to see these slides or do you want to go? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So let's, uh, let's do this. So Angela is going to help me because those lights, those yellow lights, are no.